All right. I yes. am recording it now. Yes. The recording started. All right. Pavan, you want to just quickly um, uh, do a kind of uh, introduction your own self if you like to? Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for joining this session. So, yeah, my name is Pavan and uh, I'm currently working as a senior blockchain developer in the Paramount. So, especially I'm responsible for uh, designing the uh, applications and uh, writing the smart contract related to everything uh, blockchain, even for the deployment as well. So, yeah, I'm excited to uh, answer your questions. I, I will give my best to answer your most of the questions. So, let's see. All right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, so, so for I mean, um, I had you know uh, been talking to a lot of people um, out here in Hyperledger uh, uh, fabric community where people are you know building. So what I see is whenever people um, you know enter this, the most confusion uh, state they have is in how the transactions are you know going through. Maybe if you can. Um, show us some diagrams or you know maybe do a whiteboarding and show us how actually a transaction happens on uh, you know fabric just to start up uh, it's just a warm up exercise guys pressure are, pressure is on you you have to uh, you know make this really you know uh, ask questions whatever questions you have no question is a bad question just in that spirit i would like all of you to think about whatever questions you have and let's make this a very uh, useful session for everyone. So, uh, Pavan, over to you um, yeah. for the... All right, thank you. I'm sharing my screen. I hope you guys can see me, right? Sure, yeah, yeah, we can see. Okay, all right. Yeah, so currently, uh, let's consider we have two different organizations and they want to have a communication between them uh, in a distributed way, okay? So, as per the diagram here, we can see two peer organizations are there and one order organization is there. So these two peer organization, again, they are holding some kind of peers. Two peers are there and one of them is the endorsement peer. In other organization also, the situation is exactly the same. They have their own certificate authority, even for the ordering organization as well. There is a dedicated certificate authority, which I haven't mentioned here, but yeah. So we will have a separate certificate authority for each and every organization. So talking about the transaction flow, the first thing is to interact with our network, we require certificates because this is a permission plus private network, right? With uh, only authorized entities are allowed to interact with the network. So as per the business use case, these two, uh, two peers, sorry, two organizations are uh, in a bond with, uh, to have a communication actually. And what, how transaction will take place? But before, before going to the transaction, let's discuss like what exactly the process to how uh, to create the, uh, create this network. First step is creating all the certificate for all the participant in the network. So using those certificate authority, we will create all the certificate for all the participant in the organizations. Who are the participant? Peer is one of the organization. Cli all the clients we talk about and admin or the users, those are the uh, participant of the organizations. For all of them, we will create the certificate using certificate authority. For other organization also, we will do the same thing. So what is the next step? To have a communication between these two different organizations, we require to have channel artifacts. What are the channel artifacts? Those are nothing but the uh, initial blocks actually. Uh, Genesis blocks generally we create and channel the transactions file, which is responsible for creating the channel later on. So those channel artifacts we will create. Once we have these channel artifacts, Next step is to create a medium between this organization to have a communication. So for that, using that channel the transaction file, we create the channel. So using that channel, now they have a medium to communicate, but what kind of communication they are going to do? So for that purpose, they will, they will write some kind of business logic. That is nothing but the smart contract. Sometimes we call it chain code. So that chain code will get deployed between these organizations on the channel, actually between these organizations. And finally, using the smart contract, they can communicate with each other. Okay, so for transaction flow, let's go to the first step. So this client is responsible for doing the transaction and let's consider this client is belonging to the organization one. It could be any one uh, client, like organization one and organization two. So order will not have any kind of, uh, I mean, client uh, user. They will have admin uh, who is responsible for doing some administrative operations, but yeah. There would be always client for the organization one and organization two. Again, it depends on our use case. First thing, 
this client need to have the party uh, uh, public key private key and the certificate okay so this client when they have the public key private key and the certificate because using username and password we don't have anything username and the password in the public key. these these are the uh, transactions which get invoked using this uh, their uh, signature first and the certificate as well so this client will have will need to uh, create the transaction proposal signed proposal generally we call it so the signed proposal first they will create and this client will send this transaction proposal to the all the endorsing peer in the network again it depends on like how many endorsing peers are there uh, during the uh, deployment of the chain code we define the ch uh, chain code policy if we are not defining explicit explicitly implicit is the majority so in our network we have two organization first is this peer organization second one is this one and uh, what is the majority of the two it's two so it means we have to have two endorsements for successfully execution of the transaction so this client will send this transaction proposal to the endorsing peer zero of the organization one endorsing peer zero of the organization two so in this phase okay so this is the most important phase that uh, generally uh, we have one uh, we have one uh, system chain code that is the ESCC endorsement system chain code. At this phase, transaction get validated. How exactly it validated? So this peer will check if the client is really authorized to the transactions. If he is, then he will check uh, if it has a proper uh, signature. How generally signature uh, validated during the during sending this transaction proposal to the endorsing peer? Client create a signed the proposal. So what is the process for? creating the signed up proposal let me show you okay here so uh, these are the proposal bytes okay left side you can see let's consider this is the proposal like having some information like function name which function you want to invoke what are the different arguments what is on which chain code uh, you want to interact and the channel id okay so how generally this digest get created i will show you here this proposal bytes uh, at the uh, client side only they create a hash generally we call as a digest sometimes or hash yeah, it doesn't matter so this hash get signed with private key of the client and it happens at the client side only so and finally this signature get created and you can see here what is the signed proposal it's a signature plus proposal by original proposal by and this get sent to the uh, endorsing peer okay so how endorsing peer validate whether it's a valid or not once you get the signature plus the uh, proposal by it. So in this signature, uh, so this endorsing peer just decrypt with the public key of the client. In this process, in the signed up proposal, this client will send us a certificate as well. Okay, in, in the certificate at the bottom, we will have a public key of the certificate. Using this public key, we can decrypt the signature and get one digest hash, right? And using the same way how client created the signature, we have the proposal byte here. Using this proposal byte, again, anyone can create a hash and we'll get in this hash digest. If those are those digests are exactly the same, it means this certi if the certificate is valid, then we can consider this is the valid transaction sent by authorized transaction only. So this is the process generally happens actually. Okay, okay. This, this is yeah. this is quite valuable, yeah. Yeah, in uh, case, uh, yeah, Pavan, Pavan, mm -hmm. I have a small query over here. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, right, there will be a consensus happens, right? Either it's a mm -hmm. proof of stake or proof of work. So, mm -hmm. what exactly the consensus mechanism here we are following, Pavan? And you know, uh, how how you know do we do it in terms of you know co the the code or in the how that you know proof of consensus work so that you know that transaction is completely valid. And a yeah. very good presentation, Pawan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, we'll go, we'll come to the consensus after this transaction flow completion. Uh, yeah, that's also a very good question. So uh, we'll we'll uh, uh, go through it once we are done with this transaction flow. Okay. So this uh, endorsement phase. So generally, this validation happens, and after that, this endorsing peer uh, endorses the transaction. What is the endorsement process? Endorsement is nothing but just again signing that proposal and create an endorsement. Is signature only. That is nothing but the signature. So this owns this endorsing peer create the uh, uh, sign the proposal again at this phase only while while executing our smart contract it create read set and the write set. 
when we talk about the decoding the block and checking the content of the block, I will show you how exactly this looks like, like read set, write set, how endorsement looks like, how many endorsements are there in the transaction. We'll see, uh, I have decoded some of the blocks later once we're done with this, I will show you. So finally, this endorsement again sent back to the client. Okay, here. This client again validate if this transaction have sufficient endorsement to execute it. So as per the endorsement policy, uh, we require two endorsements. So client will wait until he get two, uh, two endorsement and he get it, he create a signed, uh, sorry, transaction uh, response and send back to the orderer. Responsibility of the orderer is nothing but just uh, chronologically order these transactions, create a block after specific uh, configuration we define. Uh, it depends on the batch time or batch size. Finally, once the block is created, one of the orderer will create uh, uh, sign that block again. At the bottom of the each block, we will have the signature of orderer as well. So once this created the block and signed the block, that block gets sent to the leader pair of the organization. So how we will decide whether the uh, peer one or peer zero is the leader pair? It totally depends on the configuration how we define. So there are two configuration. First one is the static, or second one is the dynamic. So let's consider at the point of time, we have to, uh, uh, this peer one is the leader pair and we're following the dynamic selection of the leader pair. That is again, an election process happens in, in between the peers and one leader pair get uh, chosen at the runtime. So now this peer got the block, right? So this peer's responsibility to just disseminate that block, broadcast that block to other peer in the organization. Finally, <coughs> I'm sorry. Finally, each peer will just decode the transaction from the block, execute, sorry, uh, uh, validate the transaction. Now, what kind of validation happening here? So each peer will validate if he has a sufficient endorsement, each endorsement is valid or not. And there is one MVCC multi-version concurrency control also, uh, validation happens. And all the validation goes successful, then the transaction gate uh, committed into the ledger. Again, ledger have two parts. First one is the, current state database, second one is the chain of the block and both of the places, the transaction will get added. So this is the overall transaction flow in the hyperledger fabric. So anyone have any questions on this part? Yeah, I think I have already got a couple of questions related to that. Uh, so uh, one is um, from Lakshmi. So she's asking that, uh, or he's asking, is the client sending the transactions to the order? I guess this is uh, this is solved. But if you like to answer this, and um, further is being said is I thought that client send the transaction to peers. Yeah, yeah. First in the first phase, it will send to the peer once he get a sufficient endorsement. Finally, this client again sent to the order as well. Right, right. Yeah, it will um, go through the client. Only. Pavan, I have a basic query, Pavan. When you say mm -hmm. client, who exactly mm -hmm. this client is? Is it the okay. hyperledger or what exactly? Okay. I'm sorry. I, I didn't get the you know, basic of that uh, client. Okay, okay. Client is just nothing but the user. So let's consider you are part of the network and you want to invoke the transactions, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, we have some client library, fabric network. Previously, we used to have fabric client. So okay. these, uh, these libraries are right now doing all things for you you generally just create the transaction proposal and send uh, to the fabric network, right? So fabric yeah. network is doing everything for us. We don't need to worry on this. I'm just trying to explain how internally it happens. Okay. 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 So that means, you know, the organization one and organization two are not, you know, the, uh, you know uh, or the sender and receiver or how we can take it up? No, so I didn't get your question. Uh, so what I'm asking is, Mm -hmm. Organization one and organization two, right? Mm -hmm. They are, you know, you know, it can be considered sender and receiver, right? Or from the client perspective, how we can take it up, uh, Pavan? Okay, all right. So this client belonging to the organization one, right? Yeah. So oh. it not necessary. It not necessary. I mean, the client could be part of any one, any one of the organization. So they just create the transaction proposal and send to the endorsing peer. So this client will connect, will get connected to all of the peers in the. Uh, so there is okay. a discovery service which is responsible for getting uh, for that particular channel and the smart contract how many endorsements are required. So this client is responsible for getting this, and okay. at the runtime they will get this information and send this transaction to each of the peer. 
Okay, I got it. So in general, client used to connect to both the endorsing yes, players, exactly, which is exactly. both the sender and receiver of that, and then you know yes. the, they try to coordinate, and then the the yes. set of CPUs the batches start. Yes, okay. exactly, exactly. Uh, any other question? Um, there are a couple of questions from Shane. So Shane, if you can just unmute and ask your questions. Because they are very specific to diagrams, and and he's pointing to specific areas of the diagram, so that would be great if you can unmute and ask. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in the I have a little bit confusion over the peers, right? Because mm -hmm. in the uh, documentation, say there are three peers: uh, endorsing, committing, and also the um, order of peers, right? So in the diagram here, where is the mm -hmm. committing peers identity located? Okay. Okay, all right. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so there are four roles of the peer. First one is the committing, second one is the endorsing, third one is the leader peer, and fourth one is the anchor peer. Okay, so these are the nothing but role. The, they are not differentiating the peer. So one peer can play all of the four roles at particular time. So previously, someone have asked Robert uh, about the consensus, how exactly it happens. So we will uh, okay go through that. But before that, roles of the peer. When, when clients send this transaction to the peer, that peer act as an endorsing peer. Okay, so how generally we define, we install the smart contract on the peer and that will be uh, the endorsing peer for that. Okay, so in the initial phase, this peer is acting as the endorsing peer. Okay, so next when the client get the endorsements sent to the order and order create a block and finally send that block to the leader peer. Okay, so I told this process is just dynamic at any point of time this election can happen and they can so if peer one goes down so peer zero would be the leader peer for that organization right so this leader peer will again peer zero is again at this point leader peer next one is the committing peer when we are sending this block to the leader peer leader peer again sending this block to all final uh, all the peer in the organization right in the final phase the same peer is acting as a committing peer Okay, so this committing peer is nothing but just do the validation. Uh, VSCC generally, I mean, it execute the VSCC. That is a system chain code which is responsible for validating the system, uh, validating the uh, transactions coming from that block. At that point, it plays as the committing peer. And what is the anchor peer? Okay, so this client sending this transaction to the endorsing peer. How generally client get the information which peer is up and running? Okay, so in each organization, we can define one of the peer is the anchor peer. And right now, the our network is the state for we have only two peer in each organization. But let's consider we have 10 peer in each organization. <coughs> now, how we will know which peer is up and running and which peer is endorsing peer? So for that purpose, this anchor peer is responsible for that, just collecting the data like which peer is up and, up and running in the organization. And so that client can connect to that anchor peer only and get all the information within that organization. And once you get the sufficient endorsement, like how many endorsing endorsements we require and which one of them are up and running at this particular time. And that client will send the transaction to those endorsing peer only. So in this way, we have to, total four uh, roles of the peer. Endorsing peer in the endorsement phase, committing peer at the commit last phase, that is the last phase of the transaction leader peer at the sending of the order uh, block from the orderer to one of the peer in the organization and anchor peer which is responsible for collecting the data uh, collecting the information about which peer is up and running in the organization you got it right so is that answer your question yes thank you very much um the okay. second question i have is on the orderer itself um so in case of these two organizations so who should be running the orderers okay it depends again yeah, so, um, <clears throat> okay. So here we have three orders, right? So one of the organization can uh, hold this order organization as well, but then why other uh, order, I mean, organization too will trust on this, like order is responsible for doing that. If they, they want to do something, they can do it, right? So it depends, like uh, you can hold some of the order as well, like one orderer and two orderer, and you can decide like two or three orderers you want to uh, final, uh, what we can say, like signature. Okay, so this orderer can be hosted by each organization as well. So let's talk about it. We have three different organization in the network. 
each organization can hold one order in pair so that in the final transaction they will have always a uh, minimum two i mean out of three orders while we are using this for high availability even though one up goes down it will it will, our network will be up and running it totally depends on our business use case like who will hold this order order organization so they can distribute this ordering nodes or they can one of the organization can hold this thank you that's very clear Okay, talking about the consensus process. Quick, oh, no, just a quick question. Um, so I'm specifically looking at um, different clients transferring assets between each other. Uh, and the goal is to get the approval time as short as possible. So sub second, you know, your transfer has been accepted by the system um, via consensus. So I'm curious what kind of tweaks we can do to the system uh, that improve the response time to the client. Okay, all right. Yeah, uh, okay. So when we are creating the genesis block, right? Uh, so generally we define, uh, there are two parameters for the order, uh, batch time and the batch size. Okay, batch time is nothing but the time required to create the block. And batch size is nothing but the how many transactions you want to add in a single block. So both of them, uh, we configure, we generally configure while creating the genesis block. Okay, what happens when client is sending the transactions, right? So orderer will wait until he get single transactions. If within a two within a two second he is getting one transactions, then also orderer create a block and send finally to the committing peer. I mean leader peer and finally to the committing peer. This is the first approach. Second one, if within a one second the client sent ten transactions to the orderer, in that case as well, orderer will create a block immediately because one of the criteria is matching either block size or uh, block time. So if one of the criteria is matching, order create a block and finally send to the uh, committing pair. Finally, I, I'm talking about the finally committing pair. So you can tweak this uh, parameter and you can make it like as soon possible when you are you are getting one transactions or maybe within a one uh, hundred milliseconds if you are getting one, any kind of transactions, whether it's a 10, 20, depends. Uh, you can create a block and you can tweak that parameter actually. Thank you. Uh, Pavan, I have one basic query, Pavan. Uh, mm -hmm. Where does, you know, the database as a concept is used when, you know, when the transaction happens as such? Or, mm -hmm. you know, how, you know, blockchain as such, you know, stores it as a ledger? Okay. Yeah, okay. So finally, I mean, uh, uh, finally, when peer commit the transaction side, what exactly happens? So in the ledger, this data get added. What exactly the ledger? Ledger is nothing but uh, a combination of two parts. First is the chain of the block, that is the blockchain. And second is the current state database. That is the latest state of that particular asset uh, gets stored. So let's talk about one asset. Car is the asset. Uh, car one is the key for asset. And we are adding some data like color, model, whatever the data you want to add, right? So this client has done first transactions. Car one, uh, one of the field owner is the owner one. Okay, so first transaction executed and sent back to the uh, sent to the ledger. Now, in the current state database, we will have the value for that car one asset with the owner one, and in the chain of the block as well, we will have that information. So let's consider another one client came and he changed, or maybe same client has changed the second transaction with the owner one uh, owner two. It's the same car. Okay, so. At that time, current state database will have the latest value of that asset. That is the car one. We will have owner equal to two. Okay. And in the chain of the block, we will have one more transactions there. It means we will process the history transaction one with the owner one, transaction two with the owner two. It means at any particular point of time, we can check the history of the transaction who has done for this car one, how many transactions happen in the uh, our blockchain. So first transition was the owner one with the owner one and second transition was the owner two. But in the current state database, we will have the latest value for that particular access. Is that answer your question? Okay, requesting everybody to be on mute and I am unmuting uh, Indrajit right now. Indrajit, you can ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pawan. Actually, I have um, uh, one uh, network design question, which you already 
touched a bit. Um, so um, whenever I bring up a um, blockchain network, like a fabric, hyperledger hyper fabric network, I mm -hmm. always have a doubt, like, should I have order orders in organization itself or to have a separate uh, single organization for orders? So I, I want to know, but what does it, I mean, what is what are the advantages and disadvantages of having a separate organization for orders or having the uh, orders part of the organization? Because I asked um, these questions to a um, hyperledger fabric chat um, long ago, and then they prefer to have a. I mean, the thing is like if you have single order organization, then it defies the. Uh, meaning of a truly distributed network because then it becomes a single organization which manages orders. But um, uh, I think few people uh, who are like uh, very- uh, Sorry uh, about that. Uh, uh, guys, you can you can continue now. Okay, yeah. So um, is it like uh, um, organization can have uh, as a net, as a network, uh, they can have two organizations where uh, one can host the peers and then uh, other organization uh, hosts the orders. So how do you, uh, like from your experience, what's your preference to have um, uh, um, uh, like orders? How do you um, have orders? Do you have a, okay. uh, yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, so all right. So let's consider, uh, I mean, there, there could be different kind of scenario. So let's consider uh, uh, one example, uh, putting the agreement on the blockchain network and we have two organizations. First one is the IBM, second one is the Lenovo, right? They they generally have a lot of communication in terms of the hardware, like IBM uh, gets some laptops from the Lenovo and they want to have all the agreement on the blockchain, right? So in that case, let's consider, IBM is wholly, solely responsible for that, to maintaining this. So in that case, IBM can hold the order organization and other organ So of course, every transaction will get executed as per the business rules we define in the smart contract. But yeah, uh, they, in that case, uh, IBM can hold the ordering node. But there are some scenario like the other organization never trust on the other, uh, I mean, uh, other organization in the network. So, so in that case, they can hold their own ordering node. Uh, but again, the answering the answering to the question, like it totally depends on your business use case, what they want exactly to achieve. And depending on that, we can have this ordering node to the specific uh, or, or peer organization as well, or we can have a common ordering node as well. So some organization will hold, uh, of course, maintain it. Okay, thanks. All right, so, um... Pankaj, you can ask your question. I'm asking you to unmute now. Pankaj Singh. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Pawan. Uh, so my hey, question man. is uh, regarding to the client one. So in this uh, diagram, you have shown that there's one client which is communicating with organization one and organization two. But in a real scenario, I believe there are different clients for different organizations to communicate with their uh, peer node, right? Yes. So yes. Is, it, is it possible that a client which is of organization two uh, can query or can do transaction on organization one directly if somehow let's say it, uh, it has their path or everything so is it possible still see i mean see no no client is sending directly uh, any data to the organization two or organization one they are going through this consensus process okay uh, we'll we'll talk about the consensus process like how exactly it achieved but the, the, whatever the transaction flow i uh, mentioned here right the same way any of the client will send the data, even though it's a part of organization two or organization one, because creating the signed proposal is totally depends on the client. So client creating the signed proposal by using his private key, right? And the uh, library we're using fabric network. So this organization can also have a separate API server. This organization also can have a separate API server. But the finally, when they are talking with the endorsing peer, they want to add some data then of course they will go to this process only. First, this client will get the sufficient information, like how many endorsing peers are there for that particular channel and the particular uh, chain code. Once they get the data, they will send the transaction to the endorsing peer. Okay, the reason I ask this question because uh, I have this uh, scenario during my one of POC where I have one uh, client where I do the network discovery and everything. 
and i just tried to query something from organization 1 although my client was not part of organization 1 but still it is able to do the query uh, like it will able to execute the smart contract and get the data from organization 1 itself so uh, like uh, i need to put the some kind of check in my smart contract but is it like uh, a fundamental function of the hyperledger or is it some kind of flaw or maybe i'm doing something wrong okay yeah so query part never goes to this transaction process they never change the state of the check blockchain they generally while doing the query right so i am part of this organization one and i am do, i am doing a query so in that case one of the pa will give the data directly they will not go through this transaction process or something fetching data directly from the peer is possible straight forward from the same organization peer only okay but even the private data like public data i understand but uh, i tried mm -hmm. to get something from implicit uh, collection and mm -hmm. i still get that data so should not be there some kind of authentication some mechanism so that uh, no other client organizations can connect with the other organization and get the private data okay so see if you are storing the private data on the other peer then definitely they will be able to access it right so you have to define your use case while uh, i mean initial phase only you have to decide like where you want to store if you are storing only on the organization one then definitely only the client from the organization one only will be able to get the data the other uh, organization two user will won't be able to get the uh, collection actually i mean uh, private data collection they won't be able to they will get an uh, issue access issue actually that is that is the problem like i just simply create a smart contract with query function and no no checks and everything and the client from organization 2 will still able to get the private data of organization one uh, organization one so uh, maybe i am doing something wrong and maybe there is something uh, with the certificate so uh, okay so is it how, possible how you have defined the chain policy uh, so while uh, adding the private data collection so you have defined one chain code policy right who can uh, store the data and who can access it so depending on that you will be able to do it even though uh well, both of the organizations are part of the one channel but there is a private data as well then uh, you can uh, you can constrain to the uh, constrain into the uh, smart contract itself but as per my understanding they won't be able to get the data private data actually until and unless they are part of that particular organization okay so in case of implicit organization do we still need to provide some kind of policy or no 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 not... uh, implicit all the, all the users from the same organization they will will be able to get that data for the implicit we don't need to worry on that by default it is there in the fabric in 2.1 above okay okay maybe, maybe i'm doing something wrong because i am getting data from implicit collection and that's why i didn't provide any policy so i was in a thought that uh, every client which has its own certificate for that organization should be able to communicate with that and not to any other organization but in this case client from another organization can still able to query private data from another organization so maybe something yeah maybe we can uh, maybe after this session we can think of and try to uh, get exactly what this happened wrong oh, cool, cool, cool. yeah. thanks thanks for that we are loving the conversation so um i am unmuting lakshmi um asking to unmute lakshmi you there because yeah 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 lakshmi. thank you yeah thank you nice presentation pavan yeah my doubt is uh, like related you were mentioning that uh, the leader pair can be set in the configuration file is it yes yeah, yeah. so i didn't uh, see anywhere like i have seen only like uh, setting the uh, anchor pair so is it is it like similarly like setting the anchor pair we we are setting the leader pair or the mm, network leader. automatically selects it over okay, no, leader pair the configuration generally defined in the docker compose of the pair let me show you probably that here In test by network, default, I didn't find I didn't find anywhere in test network, and so that's why I'm asking. Yeah, Did yeah. In the peer, generally it get defined. In the peer peer uh, configuration, if you want to make it static or dynamic, okay. by, by default it's the dynamic. So probably that's why it's not there. But in the peer configuration file, you can see. Maybe let me show you here itself. So. You can see here. In the code. Use okay. literally by default configuration is there. Use leader election is the true default. Con this is the default configuration you will get for the peer code or YAML file. Or leader false or true. It depends on like which peer you want to make it. If it is a static. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Pavan. And one more doubt, uh, like uh, regarding to the orders. So there are there will be multiple orders, is there? So in a, so normally, do we need to go with three or uh, more than three orders is good for a use case? Again, uh, I mean that would be depend on the business use case. So generally, people uh, prefer like odd number of, of course, first one we have to have odd number three, five, seven, and uh, depending our. Uh, high availability you may uh, you can choose like any number like more than three five seven so nine, so seven. for a normal application is more than uh, three is needed like for good performance and all for the in order okay. for so the last uh, at least the minimum is three that i know for mm -hmm. the raft consensus but mm -hmm. uh, for if we are designing a use case like see i mean if you feel your one of the order one or two orders are getting frequently disconnected or maybe going down so in that case your network will be will not be up and running right i mean uh, so you will face an issue while submitting the transactions if your only one order is there so in that case uh, you can have five even though two of them goes down then three will be there and uh, with the three also we can achieve the consensus so the ideal count do you suggest is five or uh... it again it depends like uh, you feel like uh, if your two orders are going down frequently or one okay. order, order is going frequently Frequently or sometimes also, I mean, it depends like uh, which service provider you are using, cloud provider. Okay. So yeah. So here, here in the figure, like the three order comes under one uh, order organization. So can mm -hmm. we split uh, it like one or order organization con consists of two order and another order organization consists of two order like that? Do we need to decide anything? Yes, yes, yes. We can decide. Yeah, we had a discussion just before sometime, right? On that one. Yeah. Like it, it totally depends on this organization. They want to have a separate ordering organization for them or uh, a dedicated one. Okay, thank you, Pan. Okay, um, there was one more question um, from Harsh stating that how is Golang useful in Hyperledger? And I'm unmuting you, Harsh, if you have other questions. Uh, yes, you can so, ahead. hello everyone, I'm Harsh and I'm a complete beginner in Hyperledger and this is my first meetup. So currently I'm learning Golang and API development in Golang and I was also learning how to build microservices. So I found Hyperledger interesting, but to, I need to know the exact uh, roadmap to how to learn Hyperledger and how to start uh, working in Hyperledger fabric. And also if Golang is in any way useful in this journey. Okay. okay. So first of all, uh, if you're familiar with the JavaScript, or Go language, you can start with it because Hyperledger Fabric provides the flexibility over the client as well as the smart contract language. So you can write a smart contract language right now in the JavaScript or Go language or Java, or there are multiple other languages as well. Even our client also can be in the Go language or uh, JavaScript or Java. There are multiple options. It totally depends on you. Like if you're familiar with already, I would suggest you to start with that language only. Not, not necessarily to start directly with the Go. Yeah, there are some advantages because uh, Fabric itself is written in the Go, whole Fabric. So, uh, and uh, compared to the other languages, uh, so this Go add a lot of additional things like gossip dissemination and all the peer-to-peer -peer communication, they are using GRPC protocols, right? And Go is one of the most efficient language as per my understanding. So that's why they prefer to, uh, I mean, initially everything was in the Go. So later, because of the community, um, community uh, suggested some of the uh, new clients and all. Uh, so a lot of people are working to have this flexibility uh, on the fabric, like independent on the language. If you are familiar with the one language, that's fine. You can write your, uh, your, uh, your client and the smart contract uh, as, per, as per the knowledge you have in that particular language. So it's not necessary to write in the Go itself at the first phase, but you are familiar with the Go only, you can start with the client, uh, Go and the smart contract also in the Go. I don't know. Just one question. Uh, what is the type of you know, debugging you use? Like, you know, is there any you know, debug tool specifically? You no, know, to once you know, return your blockchain and then you know, if you want to identify how the transactions are going, you know, how where the transaction you know getting stuck in some node. Uh, directly, okay, we have I mean, the you know, is IBM internally provide something, or you know, we we have a certain you know set of building tools where we can put that. Okay, see, uh, so we have total uh, control over this client, right? So in this client, we have we can debug directly straightforward. We don't need to worry on that. But other part internally, 
uh so for day for that dedicated debugging we don't have any kind of explicitly tool but definitely we have to check the logs of each and every services you can parallelly check like uh, uh logging of the each pair like what kind of logs we are getting of course they have handled all of the errors and everything in the client side we'll get it so we have to understand like why we are getting that uh, that is the only thing probably uh on at the client side itself you will get all the errors and all so you can oh. just check that but internally we don't have any explicitly uh, tool for uh, debugging, but you will get a meaningful errors. Uh, so still, the community is working to make it more meaning, meaningful okay. in case if some of them are not there. Okay. Okay. Uh, Pavan, just one query along. Sorry. Uh, that is, you know, like, no, if suppose you know, if there is any issue on orderer side also, that also you now we will be able to know, the, you know, to know the, what exactly happened from the client side itself. That is not. Yeah. yeah. So see, of course, if there is an issue, definitely we will get at the client side. In okay. case you are not getting, just check the logs for, for that particular service. If you are feeling this orderer is facing some issue, uh, so probably we can just uh, go inside the container, check the log, or maybe directly okay. check the uh, orderer container log as well. Oh. Uh, hi, Pavan. Uh, this is uh, Avinod. Uh, I'm Box and Researcher. So uh, we are going to implement a type kind of fabric in Kubernetes. This is a live project on the launch project. Uh, we are going to uh, the data around the terabytes level. So initially we started the research on deck uh, in Kubernetes, how to deploy the hyperledger fabric, but uh, we are not uh, getting the right things. So uh, we are starting from scratch Kubernetes. We are uh, create the pods and the uh, convert the Docker file into the Kubernetes files and run the pods, those things, and we're getting the errors, a lot of things there. Uh, I still saw about some hyperledger bevel, hyperledger operator. So, which one is uh, suitable? Uh, because this is a live project, it's a big project. So, any suggestion from your side? Okay, all right. I mean, again, that's my personal suggestion. So, probably, see, I'm not an expert in the DevOps, especially. On the Kubernetes, I know the basic things, but that's a different expertise, right? For I mean, maintaining the some services in the Kubernetes. So probably I'm not the first. I mean, right guy to uh, answer on that question. But yeah, hyperledger behavior is there. Uh, there is a. I feel. I mean, I also try to use it, but I feel uh, there is a lot of tight coupling between the services. If one of goes down, other uh, so it will not uh, work. Something like that. So that's why we also have. Uh, this uh, is all the services in the Kubernetes as well, but we are not using Bevel or something. But yeah, okay. maybe uh, you guys can explore that part, Bevel or maybe uh, it's hyperledger operator is also there. So uh, people uh, and maintenance are trying to improve their services continuously. But yeah, if it's uh, saving our lot of times, then I would uh, I would uh, I mean, recommend to go through it and just explore it. Oh, so uh, even uh, Kamlesh here, I will recommend for the. Uh, HLF operator because uh, they are a kind of uh, open source by IBM blockchain platform and could be used very efficiently and is production grade available but depend on the choice but operator is also good okay thank you come on I have uh, uh, sorry yeah, Kamlesh is also with us he's one of the expert in this area so yeah you guys so it, I mean Okay, okay. In Kamlesh, we are using the going to the on-premises server only. Uh, so is it okay? Uh, is which one? Uh, so the client is asking the what is the on-premises server for this uh, large project for it's a one of the government project. Uh, so that's only I am asking here. Uh, there is okay, any uh, uh, links about that? Any repositories? Kamlesh, you Just one minute, actually, I was driving. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so meanwhile, uh, uh, there was another one question, right, on the consensus. Okay, so how consensus is achieved in the Hyperledger fabric? So in the Bitcoin, on the Ethereum, we have some different uh, options. So in the Bitcoin, we have proof of uh, work. Again, uh, in the new fabric, so Ethereum 2.0, we are going to have the proof of stake as well, right? But in the fabric, it's a different actually. This process is a little different. How exactly this transaction get added successfully in the blockchain network? Uh, consensus is nothing but just the process achieving the final uh, state of the particular asset in the blockchain. Okay, so this is the three-step process. 
first one is the endorsing phase second one is the ordering phase third one is the committing phase and in the transaction flow we have already gone through where is the endorsing phase when client send the transaction to the endorsing pair that is the endorsement phase okay so again client validation happens there created the reset and the right side by executing our own smart contract and send back to the client so this is the uh, endorsing phase what is the second phase it's a ordering phase where orderer just chronologically order the transactions and depending on the batch size and batch configuration create a block and sign that block so this process is nothing but the ordering phase and this is the second phase okay and finally this order send block to the uh, finally peer uh, leader pair through the uh, committing pair and committing pair again execute the transaction it just check uh, number of endorsements are correct and each endorsement is valid or not so that is the committing phase so combinedly these three phases are nothing but the consensus so generally we call these uh, the three phases uh, we we can achieve consensus using these three phases endorsement phase ordering phase and the finally committing phase yeah uh, any other question uh, yes i have one hi paul hi paul yeah hi yeah so yeah this is vimesh sir uh, i want to understand how similar the chain code is with the smart contract that we are writing in solidity programming okay uh, in the solidity it's a different actually and in the fabric it's totally different because uh, see we are cust- uh, i mean we can achieve whatever we want in uh, in hyperledger fabric like you can totally have your customized use case and you can add any kind of data or something but uh, in the ethereum smart contract there are limitations to add the data right i mean you can add data but it will be add expensive to offer you transaction and uh, i am very new to hyperledger can you suggest any resources or courses that are available for learning please yeah okay so first of all i would uh, i would uh, recommend you to go through the docker for i mean you are, you should be familiar with the docker uh, any basic course you can uh, uh, you can go with once you are done with the docker if you are familiar with the javascript you can start with the javascript uh, api and the smart contract as well if your family is the go or java you can do it i mean accordingly uh, first thing is official documentation i would recommend official documentation is the best resource right now and uh, i created some of the simple use cases not very solid proof but i try to cover most of the hyperledger fabric things on the youtube channel so yeah, the I, youtube I, channel i purchased your udemy courses also uh, udemy courses are for the advanced actually if you are familiar with the hyperledger fabric then you can go with that udemy courses those are little bit advanced like if you are familiar with the fabric then how to add a new organization in the existing channel or new order in the existing organization so that is first course second one is the multi host deployment like how we can do this uh, deployment on the different kind of virtual machines so that would be kind of uh, advanced i think and uh, you should be familiar with this all the uh, basic flow first if you are familiar with this then definitely i would recommend to go through this courses so that it will be Uh, easy for you to uh, just uh, do this different okay. yeah can you just put it on the chat on those two courses name alone and it will be better yeah sure sure yeah, yeah, yeah. i will i will yeah. Pavan, i have a few questions so is there a possibility to um, change the logging level on the fly like once we you know, once the network is up and running and then if i want to change the logging level of peer on orders from info to debug or debug to info as we require is there a possibility to change the configuration uh, yeah as per my understanding in the docker compose file itself right yeah yeah once okay. we start the compose the file compo- itself you mm-hmm. can you, sorry here yeah, you can see the logger logging level here right you can just restart the server that's it uh, it will get reflected immediately when you are restarting this docker restart and the container name just change this and that should work actually i tried and uh, it worked for me so we thought the resetting of the net um, each nodes we cannot change the no it will not it will not reset uh, it, it will not reset but okay, you but, can persist you, you can persist the data for that and you can just restart this container uh-huh. okay uh, what is the issue yeah. when you are resetting it no i i just wanted to know whether do we need to restart each and every node to change the logging levels 
no if you want to uh, rest i mean you want to check the logging of the pr0 of the organization one then you don't need to reset everything i mean uh, all the other containers you can do it only for the pr itself right you want to check the log of the pr0 in case if you want to do for everyone then definitely uh, you can do it yeah okay then um, i also have another question like is there any yeah. um, best practices for organizing organizing the chain code because like writing every every function in a single chain code or having uh, or separating functions between different chain codes is there any best way or it's just purely like your knowledge and business use cases yeah it totally depends on like see uh, chain codes are nothing but just a business logic and uh, so in other languages or maybe in other services how generally we maintain the code you can exactly do the same way even for the other uh, traditional technologies we maintain a code in a proper way right the same way you can follow here itself uh, there is another one thing uh, i want to mention here uh, in the fabric 2.0 and above we can install multiple smart contract within the same chain code so what is the difference between smart contract and chain code it's nothing exactly same but we have a privilege to have a multiple smart contract within the same chain code so there would be only one collection for both of the smart contract but yeah within the same chain code also we can manage it and we can make it so proper folder structures and everything it totally uh, for the developers right we can manage accordingly like whatever you feel suitable so would that Just like be... other languages based practices you can follow the same thing mm-hmm. so would in that case that would be like uh, 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 i'm writing in go so in a single go package we will have uh, like a uh, um, two or more than one a chain co- uh, smart contracts is that right sorry sorry uh, can you come again so let's say we are writing a um, um, chain code and then mm-hmm. we we have a single package mm-hmm. and then within that package we have like more than one smart contract uh, yeah that's fine that's fine it, it it depends on you right if you want to make it in that way Uh, you can make it like within i have dedicated a video on in the youtube like uh, uh, maintaining the multiple smart contract within a single chain code as well mm-hmm. okay. and also the endorsing policy is for the chain codes not for the channel right before yeah, it used every, to... no, no. so yeah endorsement policy is for the uh, chain code yeah but there are administrative policy even for the channel and for the genesis block as well mm-hmm. yeah okay i i request everybody to just raise hand so that others can also get a chance we'll will allow everybody to speak uh, we don't have uh, we are running out of time so please just raise hand we'll give chances to everybody and unmute others and uh, thank you right right thank Thanks you kartik thank you i think that's for the interest of and the fairity which we want to keep um all right um so i have uh, i have divya chandran so i am um, okay my question is that i want to set a local fabric network okay for that uh, how i can do that uh, i i don't i don't want to connect to kubernetes or, or like that just in a lab lab setup or something for storing the data in that particular organization i want to set a local fabric network is it possible or uh, sorry actually i miss your initial uh, voice so can you repeat your question okay my question is that i want to set a local fabric network hyperledger mm-hmm. fabric network in a, yes. in a local yeah. setup that is for an organization i don't want to be connected with the kubernetes or like that is it possible mm-hmm. or how i can do that yeah yeah it's, it's possible yeah it is possible and in the official documentation also uh, uh, they have given the script for creating the local setup only right there is a test network you can just uh, you can just go through the documentation and you can just replicate the same network in your local machine without creating um, without having kubernetes as well okay that means i not in a single system i want to have four to five pcs okay five pcs yeah that is also possible so uh you have to i mean you want to do this posting on the multiple uh, virtual machines yeah that is also straight forward so you have to maintain the proper communication between them uh, probably you can use the som docker som you have to create som network and within that som network you can uh, you can allow this container to communicate 
otherwise you have to make some privilege to this communicate this uh, different con containers with each other so there is a dedicated uh, dedicated uh, course actually on this part on the udemy so you can just go through it if you feel it's useful okay okay so okay i did, okay. I, I did, I did this same deployment on the three four different machines like one order machine one for uh, for organization one third for organization two and fourth for organization three Okay. Okay. Just uh, I can just search on Udemy and find the course. Hmm? Yeah, I will. Say, I will uh, share the link over here. Okay, that will be helpful. Uh, in official hyperledger documentation, it is available. Is it available? Uh, no, no. In the official documentation, it is available for the single machine. Single machine. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I will check out. All right, so I had one question at the start of the uh, session itself, asking about what's the difference between the admin and users by Vinod. Okay, admin users and the uh, normal users, right? Client. Yes. Right. Okay, all right. So, uh, see, in the hyperledger fabric, we have defined some kind of organization unit. What is the purpose of that? Uh, the purpose of organization unit is just segregate the function, segregate the responsibility. So there are four node organization unit. First one is the admin, second one is the client, third one is the orderer, and fourth one is the peer. Okay. So in their certificate, uh, we have this information. This certificate belongs to which participant? Like it's a client, or it's an admin, it's a peer, or it's an orderer. So depending on this, generally we have some responsibility. Endorsing peer only can endorse the transactions where we have defined while creating the certificate. So it means only peer will be allowed to endorse the transaction, not the admin or the client, because they are not responsible for doing that. Only peer is responsible for endorsing the transactions. Another one is orderer is responsible for signing the block. No other entity is allowed to sign the block if they don't have organization unit as an orderer in their certificate. So in the say, I mean, in this way, they have segregated the responsibility. Only client and admin can uh, remove the transactions. Peer cannot endorse and sorry, uh, send the transactions, or orderer cannot send the transaction. Right? In the certificate, we have that all the information. So that way, we have defined this different organization unit as a separate kind of user only we can consider, and admin have some administrative privileges. Like who, let's consider in the running network, we want to add a new organization. Then client will not allow to add the new organization, right? Only admin of that organization. Those use those participants who have no organization unit as admin will be allowed to those administrative operations. So that's why they segregated this different kind of uh, participant in the network. Uh, uh, Pavan, I have one basic query for you. See, this uh, orderer is there, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the orderer is one who, who needs to do validate and then, you know, he needs to do uh, uh, the, uh, order is the transaction. So, finally, again, you know, uh, we are you know, into the part of a centralization only, right? Where is the decentralization as actually comes into the picture? Okay. See, when client, so, uh, so as per the diagram here we have, so there are two organizations, right? So both of the organizations are endorsing the transactions, right? In the first phase, endorsing phase here. Okay. And our chain code policy says each organization should endorse the transaction. If one of the organization is not endorsing, so in that case, the transaction will be marked as an invalid. They won't be able to change the state of the blockchain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then final achieving the state of the particular asset is maintaining this, I mean, going through these three process. First one is endorsing. Second one is the ordering, and third one is the committing phase. So this is nothing but just it's going through this distributed system only, right? With proper uh, uh, endorsements. Okay. So uh, th that means you know who 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 has this you know uh, orderer here? Like you know it could be a you know a, any of the uh, th third party vendors. Anybody? No, no. I mean one. Uh, see, it depends again. Uh, we I think we already have a discussion on this. But okay. yeah, see, uh, this orderer can hold by one of the organization if uh, the other organization uh, trust on this organization, or okay. they can hold some of the ordering node between this uh, cluster. Okay. 
Okay, okay. Sorry, I missed that part, uh, Pawan. I'm yeah, sorry. that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a good question. It's one of the confusing question for everyone, like for the new and intermediate people, or new and for sometimes the expert as well. Yeah. Okay, I am um, asking Archana to ask a question. Archana, you there? Uh, sorry, I was talking on mute. Okay, right. yeah. Hi, Pavan. Uh, so, like, is there a way where we can get the history for the PDC implementation? History for the PDC? Yeah, we don't have that in. Uh, uh, right now, it's not yet implemented. I mean, uh, getting history for the private data collection. Yes, yes. Yeah, we, it's not yet, uh, I mean, implemented in the fabric. You cannot get the history for the private data collection. Yeah. And uh, my second question is like, uh, we have three coach DB. Uh, the thing is like, we have manipulated the data in the three coach DBs. Now, uh, I like from the organization one, I tried invoking the um, transaction and mm -hmm. I could able to update the data on the manipulated uh, data. Okay. So what is your chain code policy? It's a one, two or three. Uh, it is like or. Or, or of any one of them. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, this is a, I mean, a very good question. See here. Uh, right now, we'll talk about these two organizations. We're having two peers, right? Mm. So let's consider we have added one transaction, car one with the owner one. Okay. okay. And now, when we are talking about doing some other transactions, uh, with the, uh, I want to change the owner three. But before that only, uh, one of the users from this organization, they have access to the cows DB of this peer, right? So they have changed the owner with uh, owner five in this peer, and this you uh, one of the user from this organization also changed with the owner six. Okay, and this another one one user they want to change the uh, owner. He is considering owner is the one, and he want to change with the owner two yeah. here. Okay, so what this client does, he create the signed proposal and send to one of the endorsing peer because he require only one endorsement. Yes. Okay, and here, so you are changing. Uh, so in the endorsement phase, uh, what this peer does, we just create the read set and the write set depending on the whatever the data they have, right? So right now in this peer, so this peer have the owner six data things. Uh, Wajid, can you meet you? Okay. Pavan, just unmute yourself. I have muted all, so you have to unmute. Okay, all. all right, sorry. All right. Yeah, so here, so this peer will just simulate the transactions and create the read set and the write set. Doesn't matter like what data he has, he will just update the data because this peer is considering whatever the data they have, it's a valid one. So in that case, he will write the owner six with the owner two, and this client will just simulate, uh, sorry, client will just check. We got one endorsing, endorsement, um, endorsement, and just sent to the order, order, creative block, and final send uh, committed into the ledger. So that's why our chain code, we should have multiple endorsement. If these two endorsements are not matching, in case, <coughs> as per the endorsement policy, we have only one. So that's why it's getting executed successfully. It's not checking anything, even though you can check the history in the transaction, but it will get the transaction get added successfully. So while uh, deploying our smart contract, we have to have the chain code policy majority either or each organization should endorse the transaction. So in this phase, let's consider we have we have a chain code policy that each organization should endorse the transaction. So in that case, here itself, the client will check if each endorsement is correct or not. If, if each right set is correct or not, here itself, the transition get discarded. So that's why we it's important to have multiple uh, organization endorsement policy here. Okay. Is that answer your question? Uh, means one more clarity. It is like uh, couch DB URLs we have, right? Yeah. In the couch DB we logged in and there itself we changed the data. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah.
So even yeah. means the data would be like it would be sinking right across all the pre peers. Even if we put or or and, it doesn't matter. Like right? read write sets match in that case. Okay, sinking of the data. Mm -hmm. See, uh, in the cows DB, we have one uh, one thing. It's a uh, height of the ledger. Okay. If the height of the ledger is same exactly on the peer, they will not sync up. If some peer misses some transactions, let's consider peer one have the ledger height. Ledger ledger height is nothing but the block number. Let's mm -hmm. consider we have created total ten blocks till now, and this peer misses some transactions. Like we have done again uh, ten transactions later, and two blocks get added. This peer will get synced with this uh, other peer if the this ledger height is mismatching. If it is mismatching, then only the data gets synced. Otherwise, if the ledger height is exactly same, it means they they are considering they have the latest data only. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, Pawan. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other question? All right. I am asking to unmute uh, Pankaj Singh. Yeah. So my question mm -hmm. is uh, related with the private data collection only. So mm -hmm. let's say I have put some details about my car in my private data collection, which has like car model name and its price and everything. I want to sell mm -hmm. it to some other person on the same network. Mm -hmm. The other person has a process where he can, let's say, get the data of the chain. He can generate a hash of that and match if the hash is verified, uh, hash is available on the network or not. Yes, that way exactly. he, he can identify if this, that yes. is the correct data. Now, yes, yes. In, in, the, in the previous process, when I have put my private data collection, like user one has put the uh, details with owner, user one. Mm -hmm. He has verified it's fine. Now he has sold the car and now owner has been changed to uh, user two. Now, if this user two wants to resell the car to user three, if user three will uh, like uh, create the same hash with user one name, so that hash, because that hash has been already on the chain. So will this, this also work? Uh, uh, will this work as well? Because uh, now no, see, at this okay. point of time, the uh, mm -hmm. honor has been changed. Yeah. Okay. See, this you're talking when you're talking about the private data. So organization one is selling this data, uh, this car to the organization two user, right? Right. So in that case, see when we're adding any kind of private data, any private data for the car one with the owner one. So that has get added onto the on chain. Okay, right. and other data is available in the private data collection itself. Now you are saying you want to sell this car to the user of the organization two. Okay, so this organization two should say save same information with the owner two in the private data collection and send the transit transaction on the on chain actually. And right. when organization two is uh, selling again car to some other organization user, so in that case also that same verification will happen. So you have to uh, you have to add some privilege there, like against which data you want to verify this card. If it's uh, organization two, and what was the owner of the organization two in the private data collection? Just give him me information, ask him create a hash, and just check on the on chain. So in that way, I mean, uh, we can manage that day. Uh, in the in the same process where the organization one uh, has been initially updated the uh, private data collection with let's say owner equals to user one. And there is a hash already generated for that. Now I have updated the same record with user two. Now there is Where, going, in the same organization or in, the, organization in the same organization, the same private database. Uh -huh. I just had updated the key with user one to user two. There is an another transaction which has been uh, hashed and distributed across the system, across yes, network, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So there are two hashes now. One hash which says honor is one, user one, one. another is says mm -hmm. honor is two. user two. So yes. how we can uh, like remove this process because at, uh, at this moment the actual data is with user two separated data but if the any other uh, organization user will uh, create a hash with user one it will also get matched with the hash which has been generated previously but it's not the actual state of that particular uh, car so is there any way we can avoid this process like we can identify okay uh, this is the invalid hash now because the current data has been updated with user one to user two now Okay, all right. Okay, so see, first of all, uh, Rajit, can you mute yourself, please? Yes, Pavan, you can unmute. So, see, first of all, why we are uh, storing the data into the private data collection, I didn't get. See, if you are saving in the private data collection, it means confidential data, right? 
and right. you don't want to share with other organization if you, even though you are changing the owner or something how someone can verify it? you can of course you can share directly data to him and just ask him to verify the hash if the owner ownership is getting changed then that should be on the direct public chain i feel and the confidential data just like a price or something which is not uh, required to know everyone i mean if a transaction happening with an organization one and two the price was p1 and the same car is changing ownership from owner 2 to owner 3 the price is something different that data we can maintain into the private data collection but in case if you want to change if you want to change uh, the ownership of the car 1 to 2 then organization 2 should just keep the data of that particular car in his own collection and ask anyone to just verify it in case if you want okay maybe maybe if, i get get the get, uh, wrong example with owner let's take it this is the price one initially i have created uh, this record in my private data collection with price equals to 1 lakh let's say for the car mm -hmm. and now i updated that price to 80000 I have mm -hmm. asked two different users uh, to verify the data, one with the 80,000 and one with the 1 lakh. Because the hash of these two transactions has already been distributed, if they try to create a hash and verify, they will, they both reports will get verified, right? Or it will not. No, okay, both of them are different. Uh, okay, what? All right, yeah. See, I mean, private, in the private data collection, we are storing the sensitive information just like a price or something. Uh, right. 80, you can add any number of transactions and all the transactions will get validated against the data and the hash will be valid. But it totally depends like other organization, org2 is there, right? They want to verify the data against which data they will verify. It totally depends on uh, their uh, communication. Like they want to uh, uh, they want to compare with the price one, price two, price three. Uh, it, it depends on their uh, I mean requirement, I feel. It totally uh, depends on the business use case. Okay, okay, got your point. Okay, Satya uh, Rajendran, you can ask your question, please. Uh, hi, Pavan. Thanks for the session. Yeah. Hi, um, Pavan, this question is about the implementation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, implementation of the deployment. So, when we want to deploy the Hyperledger fabric for two organizations, okay, the organization one is a manufacturer, another one is a seller, for an example. So, manufacturer initiates a, a, a deployment and uh, they do the CA organization one and the order and everything, right? And mm -hmm. the same thing, the same infra has to be set up in the different data center or it has to be done along with the same data center in all the servers. Uh, how these two organizations set up in two different locations, how this peer joins the, the first organization channels? Okay. See, there are two things. First one is the having communication or maybe making on this different uh, centers, different location. Uh, okay, and related to the fabric, they are already they are distributed and they are having a communication between them. So in case if you want to make this in a separate virtual machines, first thing, or if you want to make it multi-region or something. So probably for that, you have to maintain the network accordingly. So why we are having this multiple peer here? Because if some of the peer goes down, uh, other peer will be up and running, even in case of the orderer as well, right? So we have to make sure these peers are not in the same virtual machine. If the virtual machine itself goes down and both of the peers we made for the high availability, then that would make that would not make any sense, right? Because if the virtual machine itself goes down, so our network right. will be down. So in that case, we have to maintain these peers on the different kind of uh, region or maybe different kind of virtual machines. It totally depends on us and we can follow the same approaches how generally we do for the traditional technology, maybe other services, not only for the fabric, but general purpose. Okay, yeah, that is for the high availability of the peers, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we go for multiple availability zone and then we distribute it. So that is clear to me. Now, mm -hmm. the organization too, I'm talking about it. So I have, let's say I have an AWS account. Mm -hmm. I'm setting a multiple peer in different availability zones to meet the high availability. Now, when talking about organization too, let's say they are in on-premises, they are not into an into the cloud. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And they do they do installation of uh, their own hyperledger fabric and they create orderers, right? Every organization have their own orderer or okay. That's we have or we have one orderers uh, set of orderers for the entire fabric. How does it work, uh, Pavan? Is my so one, 
I mean, one orderer for the entire fabric, or I didn't get that question. Yet. Okay, so now in this diagram, we have orderer one, two, three. Okay, mm -hmm. organization one and organization two. Mm -hmm. Correct. This yeah. organization one, let's say that they are in a different data center. Let's say they are in, uh, uh, you know, Atlanta. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, this organization two, uh, they are in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Two different organization, two di geographic locations. Okay. Yeah. Now. This organization one, they're gonna have their own set of orders in their location, their data okay, center. That's, okay, that's fine. And this organization two, they are also going to build their own orders in their data okay. center. Yeah, that's fine. Correct. Now let's yeah. say assume that we got VPN in between them. All the mm -hmm. network connectivity has been established. Okay. Now mm -hmm. how this organization two in a different Ohio region, how mm -hmm. they're gonna join uh, the organization one fabric which is based in Atlanta. I'm okay. talking about only the fabric level setups. I'm you are getting it right. What kind of commands yeah, okay. we need to establish to uh, okay. uh -huh. communicate yeah, between I, these two organizations? I got your question. Okay, all right. Say first thing is they need to have it. this. This is a distributed and a decentralized uh, system, right? These different kind of services are communicate with uh, communicating with each other. If they are on the same machine, then they will be able to directly communicate with that particular addresses. Even though they are on a different machine, we have to allow them to communicate with each other directly, right? So for that purpose, uh, there there could be multiple options uh, in the DevOps how people generally allow different services to communicate uh, with each other. But SOM is one of them. SOM network you can create between these different kind of uh, virtual machines or maybe different region. Of course, region will have that virtual machines. And inside that virtual machines, you can uh, create one Docker SOM network between these different virtual machines and allow them directly to communicate. Because these orderer are, are communicating with each other and these orderer also communicating with the uh, peer as well. So it's totally depending on the configuration, like how you are making or how you are allowing them to communicate. So Docker SOM is one of the options even on the, so otherwise you have to export some of those IPs and all. To, to mm -hmm. allow them to communicate no, with each other. But if we go for Docker Swarm, right? It is one organization installing Docker Swarm and creating multiple organizations inside it, right? But now we are talking about real-time example. The organization two is a different company altogether. Yeah, that is fine, right? We but see if, if I do a Docker Swarm, let's say I am the Docker admin or Kubernetes admin, right? When I deploy mm -hmm. it, I'm installing my containers for organization one. I have everything. I have to install organization two, which I myself is doing. It's not the second organization which is doing it, right, Pavan? Yeah, yeah, of course. That's fine. See, uh, when we are creating the SOM network, right, we should provide some sort of uh, key actually to, to join in the same network from the other organization. So what I will do, okay, you have created uh, some network on your machines and you have created all the participant uh, uh, information or certificates and all, and you have created uh, these, uh, all the peers and uh, everything, your own order. Now what you're saying, okay, so we, you created the SOM network and you are asking me to just join the SOM network and allow your net, uh, network's container to communicate uh, with mine. So for that, so uh, we will create uh, channel artifacts, right? In the channel artifacts, we'll mention that information. Okay, so, so in that domain, case, if we do this, then again, this everything is becoming coming under one swarm cluster, right? But we want to be geographically distributed in a different uh, uh, part of the world or different part of the country. Correct. See, okay, if we okay. take everything uh, under Docker Swarm, then it becomes mm -hmm. like one swarm, swarm, Docker Swarm network, and then all are part of the organization. We are not uh, achieving the real, uh, you know, peer to peer and geographically distributed or set up, right? So my only thing is that, you know, company in Australia and company in America, they want to have a fabric chain. Okay, but nowhere that they must have one common infrastructure. They must have a different uh, infrastructure in their own data centers. How they're gonna form a channel. I'm not finding yeah, okay. an official documentation of the uh, high See, uh, which is I got I got your question, yes. Uh, see, this is not related to the something, uh, I mean, strictly to the fabric. This is just a general communication. How people do their communication between different kinds of services, right? They have to expose some kind of ports or they have to expose some kind of domain so that they can communicate directly. Uh, in the channel configuration, sorry, in the block, Genesis block at the bottom, we define all the order as endpoints, you can see here. And they are communicating with each other using this uh, order addresses. You can see my screen, right? Okay. So here you, then you have to make then like, so which are exposed, uh, so other, um, so orderer one have, th uh, sorry, one of the orderer cluster have three orderer and other organization also have three orderer. Then they have to mention these all the orderers here. 
and they should be able to communicate. You have to make some uh, adjustment so that they can communicate without any issue they, they, on this domain. You got my uh, question, right? So we have to uh, make some kind of privilege. They can communicate without any issue directly. That is the only thing we have to uh, maintain. See, if I can add to it, mm -hmm. there are two different different systems sitting just next to each other or in different different continents. But the two system have their different different IP addresses. Those IP addresses can communicate with each other. That's that's more related to the communication and basics of Docker Swarm and Kubernetes can also do the same. One pod is running in one different system with different IP address. One pod is running in different system with another IP address. So there are two IP addresses which actually used to communicate with each other. And in Docker Swarm, you can make all the IP addresses as uh, master and slave. Either all of them will be master or all of them will slave. So it's the equal like rights distributed to all the system. Will we have to dig more into Docker Swarm rather than uh, fabric and uh, that's yeah. Uh, valid. yeah that's yeah. correct and one thing like see ordinary.com so let's consider we are in a different region you have your own virtual machines i have my own virtual machines so let's talk about without the swarm as well so how ordinary will know how they will resolve this ordinary.com and 7054 they will try to search in the local right first in their local or they will just try to search with this domain as well so how they will identify if this domain have a um, proper uh, service running behind that uh, particular domain. They, we have to uh, let them know like this is the domain which, which is running under this VM. Or we have to make some kind of, uh, this is just a purely communication part actually, how these different containers communicate with each other. Yeah, and Kartikar, what you mentioned, I think that is the uh, correct uh, way. Yeah, two IP addresses used to communicate do uh, system wherever it is generally two IP address and port number used to come that will be so in interest of time I think we are running out of time we will be able to take only one or two question max so uh, Ritu just uh, identify whom we can just uh... <laughs> I have all the repeat uh, uh, participants now uh, so and uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just pick one of them uh, Harsh, you can go ahead. Pavan, you told earlier that Docker is as a prerequisite for learning Hyperledger. So do we have mm -hmm. to know Kubernetes and uh, DevOps in general before starting Hyperledger? No, no, not necessary. You can start with this one and the later on. DevOps is totally different, right? Kubernetes is totally, it comes under DevOps. So you not need to necessarily know immediate, immediately, but yeah, definitely it's good to know. You can start with these basic uh, things first, and later you can uh, expert get expertise on that part. Kubernetes. Also, what are the perspectives, uh, career perspectives in hyperledger fabric, like demand and average compensation rules, etc. Maybe uh, you can. I mean, market would be the good uh, things to comment on that. But like market will uh, let you know. But yeah, there are a lot of jobs actually on the private blockchain. There are multiple framework as well. But fabric is one of the most famous uh, framework. Uh, right now in the industry. So yeah, definitely there would be a lot of opportunity. All right. I think with that, we can close this uh, uh, session. Thank you very much, Pavan. Looking at the kind of, you know, the number of hands which are still risen at this point, looks like we have to do, you know, uh, another session <laughs> very yeah, soon yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, with you. But, but absolutely wonderful to have the questions and um, great responses from you, Pavan, and everybody who just uh, joined in and uh, put the answers across. Uh, and I see a lot of people who are also writing on the chat, which means that we have such a great public to, you know, help each other out. Uh, let's keep building. Um, and uh, if any of you uh, want to um, get added to the WhatsApp group or want to have more details, please subscribe to this uh, uh, meetup uh, link, uh, which where we you have actually registered this. So um, Hyperledger India and Hyperledger Hyperledger. Yeah, uh, okay, one one more thing, like uh, maybe just let me create uh, some coupon codes for you guys. Like if you guys are interested in that, so sure. I will try to create a free coupon code and we we'll share immediately here. So please don't share with anyone. This is wonderful. See, thank you, Pavan. A lot of people are thanking you already. <laughs> <laughs>
just give me a moment i'm just creating your coupons for you guys sure sure absolutely and we have limited number of involvement on the under this so don't uh, share with anyone please otherwise you won't be able to enroll them also if you can uh, take this coupon code to our whatsapp group that will be also helpful okay right? that is fine then that's fine i will share yeah. all right with that um, okay just um, i'm just messaging everybody my number so you guys can uh, just drop me a whatsapp message um uh, and ask for a request to the whatsapp group uh, uh, and also just give a brief introduction of who you are what you do and why you want to be a part of that uh, group uh, that will help us uh, do a bit of a screening and add you there right thank you so much yeah thank you guys thank you so much for joining thank you have a great weekend guys yeah, thanks pavan thanks ritu thank you so much for having this thing very beautifully arranged thank you Thank you guys bye